Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together and give a warm welcome to our host, Natalie Asport. Hi, everyone. Hope everyone's uh, having a great week. Um, my name is Natalie Asport, and uh, this presentation is a two-part series about the AAA game art pipeline. Specifically, we'll be uh, going through a behind-the-scenes look at the process of creating the art for two of the weapons uh, from Just Cause 4. So this presentation is going to be an in-depth look. Uh, today we will be focusing on the demon crossbow from, uh, actually we will be focusing on the cluster bomb launcher uh, from the Legacy Pack DLC, which was released in 2019. So a little about me. My name is Natalie Asport, and I've been at Avalanche, for, uh, Avalanche Studios for over six years. Um, currently, as a vehicles and weapons artist, I have been responsible for creating art assets as a AAA video game developer, and I've learned a lot of the ins and outs of the production pipeline and the structure within the high-end video game development sector. Uh, I've gained a lot of experience throughout that time for making high-quality art uh, consistently, and I'm extremely passionate about sharing this knowledge. Uh, I worked on Just Cause 3, which was released in 2015, Just Cause 4 in 2018, and most recently on Rage 2 DLC. And yeah, let's, uh, let's get started. So uh, Just Cause 4, uh, we've released a Danger Rising DLC. This came out at that same time, but it was also part of the Legacy Pack. And uh, now we're gonna watch a video. So this is the, the weapon of the cluster bomb launcher. Uh, we'll go through today of the basically all of these steps. Uh, it's a non-linear workflow, and that is the pipeline for video game development. Uh, for, these, for this uh, series today, uh, we'll be going through remaking a classic, the concept, the gray box model, metrics and scale, rigging and animation, integration, wireframe, and edge flow, it continues on. Uh, therefore, depending on the weapon or art asset, the stages in the process can be switched up. So, remaking a classic. Uh, this asset is a part of a legacy pack that was released with the Danger Rising DLC. Uh, it was featured with the Rubber Ducky, the Tuck Tuck Boom, and Rico from the first Just Cause and Just Cause 3, and much, much more. And there are different legacy items that were released at different times. So the concept. Uh, while I was working on Daredevils of Destruction, um, it's, uh, well, actually, while I was working on, yeah, Daredevils of Destruction, uh, I was approached with the idea of this concept, uh, which was the original concept from Just Cause 2. And it was already a concept to work with, but it was since 2010 that we've even returned to it. And as said before, um, basically, uh, we want to stay true to the original design, and for this, we wanted to find a balance between the technological advancements and current technological constraints. So even when we have this, sometimes uh, it's not as simple as trying to copy what the concept is, but seeing that there's going to be times we're going to have to change 
it up depending because the pipeline is going to change uh, based on the project at hand. So we're going to watch another video, and this is from Just Cause 2. That'll come in handy. So I think it froze from all the explosions. <laughs> there we go. So uh, yeah, that was from Just Cause 2. And um, as you can see, it did change. Uh, the, the style, the, the way that Just Cause 4 was is a lot more grounded than what we had in Just Cause 2. And that was uh, taking that into consideration. So for the gray box, uh, the gray box is a prototype model which basic shapes are formed with cubes and primitive objects. Uh, they are used as a stand-in for more intricate models to come in and be introduced later on. Uh, it can represent the general shape and scale of the art asset. And this can help get something into the game as quickly as possible and have something for the devs to play test with. So uh, at the beginning, we needed to see how much we can reuse for the weapon or if it is a viable option to make it from scratch. Um, so towards the end of a production cycle for a game, which this is towards the end, as most D DLCs are, there is not much uh, bandwidth as there are for during the, middle, as during the middle of production. So chances are your team has shrunk. Uh, you've shifted onto other features. DLCs onto other projects, or the team has moved on to bug fixing for the main game. So typically, an efficient choice would be to reuse as much of the elements as you can from assets you already have. So creating new things are only if absolutely necessary. Therefore, reuse and recycle. metrics and scale. So the key is in this process, we need to establish the important measurements of the asset, ensure that the contact points of the weapon lines up with where the player will interact with it during gameplay. And these spe specific measurements are the metrics of the weapon. And one of the key components here is to sync with the animation team. So if you're working with a group of developers, it's not in a vacuum. You don't just create a weapon. You're working with a team. And in this specific step, it's really important to work with your animation team, and specifically those who are going to be animating the poses for how the player is going to interact and hold a weapon. So. Um, with, with that said, this was a guideline that I was given to by one of the animators to help me know exactly what components can move and what needs to stay in place. So uh, for example, the, the handle needed to stay in place. That's number one. Um, we have to keep the mag, the magazine, in that same, roughly that same spot. And the shoulder stock needed to be where the rest of the weapon was, because otherwise it would start clipping, and that would recall that would mean that animation would need to uh, basically add new poses. And it, since it's a new weapon, uh, there's no room in the budget for new animation. So even if it's a new weapon, animation we cannot rely on for creating new poses. They just don't have the time, and we don't have the budget for it. So it is imperative that we lined up the handle the trigger, and grip metrics to line up with the animations team's poses. Um, so for example, just to say, show how intricate it can get, um, uh, this is a programmer note to me, is that the under barrel, where the, in JC2, the position of the, of the, the weapon, uh, in the thickness of the under barrel and the metrics of the hollow part inside needs to stay the same. So even the thickness needed to stay the same. And there's no new rig that we had available. Um, so we 
definitely wanted to make sure that the hand wouldn't start clipping. There's some, there's some leeway in that, but um, if there's any different, does, if there's too drastic change between the model and what they already have, that could require a new reload animation. And for estimates for that is like, it can be from two hours or it can be two weeks. And so rather than have them try to decide that, it's usually easier for us to just move things on our end. It's more work for them. It's more time consuming than uh, for us on the art side. So what I did was after sort of Frankensteining what the model was, like kit bashing with previously done, via, uh, previous done weapons, I put it on top and see exactly where it lined up. And that can actually help. Just even bringing it into Photoshop can, can really give you a sense of where it needs to be. So if you look right here, that barrel is definitely too high compared to the, the one that we were using as a guideline. The stock was in perfect placement, and then the mag was slightly in front. That's something that you would communicate with your animation team. So with the, with the gray box, once we're done with that, we export that model from Maya with a dummy Lambert material. And uh, according to Maya's defi like Autodesk definition, um, Lambert is a material that represents a matte surface, such as chalk, uh, matte paint, unpolished surface with no specular highlights. So it's just simple, no, no textures to over distract the eye. And it's just something that allows whoever's playtesting it not to get distracted by unnecessary features over time. So in our uh, proprietary engine, the Apex engine, our prefabs or blueprints are called entities. So an entity already should be set up by a weapons programmer, and we would just import that model onto, onto the entity. Um, but it's the first integration, so uh, there's no functionality. It's just bringing it into the, into the engine. So if we look on the right, you can actually see um, the, uh, how the weapon looks in the editor, and then on the left is in Maya. So the first integration is just to have like a validation check with the entity viewer and make sure that it shows up in the engine. And if it doesn't, there could be potential like issues, maybe the model, uh, something's wrong with it, or if it shows holes in the model, it could, be in, it could be mean that we have to go back and fix the mesh. So rigging and animation. So the key thing here is to sync with your animation team because it's really important. Uh, there are special cases where there's flexibility with the model and the offset to the joints, depending on the joints transformations. Um, but typically, since we're reusing pre-existing uh, rigs, uh, the joints and skeleton must not change. And if you do any like naming convention switches, the, all the animated poses within the game are just not going to read it. It just it won't, it, they won't be able to communicate with each other. So again, another reason to another step to sync with your animation team. And this is the, the simple rig that we had. Sometimes uh, with a reusing a rig, we might have joints on a, a previous weapon that was utilized, but let's say on this one, there's several of those joints weren't, weren't necessary. The main joint we, we needed was the, was the barrel to shift, and uh, that was the only one that was being used. So the other ones are fine, but you just don't rename anything and you just keep it the same way. So next is integration. So after, after bringing it into the game, um, now is when we actually make it spawnable. So that way, as a player, we can pick it up and interact with it. This time, I applied a metallic dummy material to catch better light and have uh, better highlights and distinguish the forms and so it stands out more from the background and the rest of the world. So what I'm doing here now is looking out for any like, floating hands, uh, clipping, if the thumb in the, if you look like the thumb in the back of the grip might be a little pushed in, the left handle, the left hand is into the barrel, or or you can even have severe clipping into the body where 
if he's aiming and this, it looks like the actual geometry is like embedded into his shoulder, um, or if he's storing it in the back, he just clips into the body. So these are all things you have to be aware of. And uh, definitely, if you're working on your own games, it's super vital to go bring it into the game as soon as possible. Because if you don't catch these early on, you're going to do a lot more work and then find these out when it's late and it requires more work. And again, sync with animation here. So sim similar things like this, you start looking at all the different clipping. And uh, you can send these screenshots to the animation team and see what they say and if it's severe or not. Essentially, afterwards, I was told, like, no, that's, that's OK, because that's, a, that's normal, because a uh, player and there's no camera that's going to go inside the barrel. And usually, it has, a, it has like a ammunition in it. So those are things that you definitely want to check on, because if we if we spend time on things that don't need to be changed because they're not going to contribute to the final pro product, then you can move on to something else. It might not be a bad, that, that bad, bad of a bug. So revised concept. So s very small changes here, but it allowed me to get a better idea of what I was looking at and visualize it better. So as I'm cleaning up the geometry and making iterations for export integration, I can actually see the changes that I've done. With this new gray box model, I've revised, refined, and cleaned it up. So I merged, ended up um, having a conversation with the art team, and we felt like having uh, it, this weapon obviously doesn't exist. And the way that it worked in Just Cause 2 was he would take a grenade and put it in a magazine. And that was, that's uh, like a very interesting technology. It doesn't exist. Um, and even though technically these are very fictional weapons, um, we still wanted to keep it a little grounded. So it's like, well, maybe we don't have it in a magazine, just have him put it in the barrel like a, a normal uh, grenade launcher and have it go back into that magazine so that would be turned into a canister. So we merged the magazine uh, with advanced, not yet existing technology, and the grenade was now being pushed through the barrel. So here are changes. Actually, that's the old one. Here's the new changes. And you can actually see how it's changed. There are now like the designs going up to emphasize that it is one cohesive piece. The clipping is better. An animation team can modify the left-hand placement and y-axis later. So wireframe and edge flow. So here we have the final, the final low poly game res model. Now it's even more cleaned up. Just you're going through this iterative process. It's, it's OK to continue to iterate upon your low poly. And, and actually, it's very important. These changes are going to benefit the final product. Uh, topology has been cleaned up. And there's zero or minimal and gons or tries. And it's a watertight model, so there's no holes in it. Uh, verts are merged where they need to be. And then here we have the finalized high poly model. And this is going to be your texture bake model. Um, if uh, any of you are familiar with, uh, if you're in game art or you're familiar with the way that we work, is game engines can't afford to. It's getting, it's, in, it's, it's definitely improving, but. Um, Game engines can't afford to have all this high res topology in a game if we want it to run efficiently at 30 frames or 60 frames per second. So in order to alleviate a lot of that and allow more things on screen, we take the high poly and bake it down to a lower poly model so it's less of the computer, less data that the computer has to calculate. And then with the high poly, I added different materials to different elements, so that way it can create an ID map later on, or just to help differentiate 
what each part is and does. Here's another screenshot. It, it always helps to take pictures and send it around to your team, get feedback before you move on to the next step. It's always great to just really get um, any additional feedback of, of if, if there's anything you've overlooked. So next is the fun UV unwrapping. Let's go. So with this stage here, what I did was I took half that model. I literally can cut it right down the center. And to utilize all the texture space, UV'd that one half and made sure that all the shells fit in a zero to one space. So the weapon sides are mirrored. So what that means is once we get the second half, we could just move it over. Um, it might need to be creative later on on flipping. You might need to be creative uh, later on on flipping text. So that way, let's say if a weapon has an ID number on it, and it's like WPN 106, um, that's going to be mirrored on the other side, and it's going to be not correct. So you have to be creative in like flipping the geometry in there or creating a new UV shell for that, for that set. Um, you would also, when you're mirroring, you're going to find that you're overlapping your uh, shells. Might not work in certain programs like Substance Painter. So you would actually have to move it over to the left or right. And all these other internal pieces should be moved to a corresponding, basically shifted over one, exactly one UV space. So texturing. But wait, uh, there's actually a very important step before texturing. And actually, uh, quite frankly, needs should be started as soon as you get assigned a task. And that's gathering references. So even though I was using a concept from the beginning of the block out and the beginning of the entire process, I'm in the background continuously looking for and gathering references, uh, like images and videos. So by the time I reach to the texturing stage, I already have a good amount of reference to look at and, that, uh, and to help guide me. So you can never have too much reference. So again, you can never have too many references. Uh, these are a lot of things that um, will help you really hone in on all these different details that you may not even have known existed. So I gathered real world references and put in uh, a pure ref file. So these are all screenshots from uh, my pure ref file. And it's uh, what pure ref is, is an image reference organizer program. And uh, you can just like go and drag and drop from Google or something. And uh, actually, fun fact, one of the developers on it works at Avalanche. Um, and it's a very useful tool. So I looked at military websites, weapon YouTube channels, military tech channels, existing cluster bomb launcher weapons, uh, which there are none that exist currently, or at least not in the public's awareness. But uh, M the M203 grenade launcher is one thing that I, I looked at a lot. Uh, I gathered materials and texture reference. And of course, we want it to fit in the world with Just Cause 4 not just cause two. So this is a good example of improving the materials and aesthetic design to reflect the graphics improvements and technological advancements of today and since 2010 when just cause two was released. So these are different weapons that I looked at. So we just try to keep in the same family. So now we can actually move on to texturing textures. Um, as mentioned, at the beginning of the entire process, I'm gathering references. Uh, High-res photos are your friend. So I found that one was really good. It was super high-res. And what I did was I can see each and, each and every individual part of the weapon, such as highlight, metallic values, the detail, the material breakup. And I ended up actually breaking up that photo into different pieces and 
labeled what each, each piece was. So we have like a rubber stock or a plastic stock with a grainy texture on it. We have uh, brushed metal, painted metal, steel, um, all these different types of unique textures that even though it's a black weapon, there is so many different values, different metallic values on it. So in this step, uh, now it's, it's about baking the high poly model down to the low poly model to create a normal map. And here's just a, uh, a look at the substance painter texture settings or bake settings. Um, the first step is to get a clean bake. And that's just checking on the normal map, not anything else, bringing in the high poly and if you, for this weapon, uh, there was a bunch of different parts that I didn't want other details to be baked onto. So for example, um, I wouldn't want the, um, let's say the magazine to be baked onto the trigger accidentally. Or I didn't want the uh, stock grooves to be baked on the underside of, of the, the stock that shouldn't have those details. So therefore I broke down the low poly model to different components. And I named them accordingly to match the high poly broken apart in the same amount of parts. And you would just set it as uh, to match with mesh name. And it would only bake to the parts that were named that same, that same way. Uh, afterwards, you get a good normal bake. That can be, they could take some time because different, different assets call for different settings. But you shouldn't move on until you get that normal map bake. The reason why is once you start checking on the other ones, they're all going to reference the normal map. So once you do that, now you start checking on the left side all of those boxes, and then you can start uh, getting all your different special maps in there, such as world space and tangent space, and your ambient occlusion, your thickness. So after that's set, um, now is, of course, uh, where you have your normal map, and you start, when you start adding materials, you create your MPM, which is a multiple property map, and you have your base color map. Um, the MPM is the way we pack our maps. It's going to have a, met a, metallic roughness cha a metallic channel, a roughness channel, and maybe like a wild card. And uh, each channel has a different RGB value. So roughness might be in the R channel, metallic might be in a G channel, and then wildcard somewhere else. And that allows us to not have to, not for the engine, not have to calculate three different maps, but rather just one, and it can get all these different properties. So exploded parts. Um, this, you can do this technique for baking, but um, for because I was doing the match by mesh name in Substance Painter, I didn't have to do that. But I did explode the model. I had uh, I had a setup in my low poly and high poly uh, one where it was completely assembled, and then right next to it was an exploded version. And this was so when I brought it into Substance Painter, I can see it has how it looks together. And then on the left side, if I needed to look into the barrel, I needed to see the railing between where the, uh, the barrel's going to interact with the gun and maybe in the back. If I had it just assembled, I would never get to see inside. So exploding them allows me to lay them out, and I can see them easier and see around, around them where like tighter corners I wouldn't have been able to see. So this is uh, the texture progression. I start with the basic materials, again, looking at my reference. And um, I'm figuring out the materials that make up that weapon. So I refer back to the texture and material reference. The, material, uh, the metals, plastics, rubber, painted metal, shiny metal, steel, chrome. Uh, one thing that was very interesting here was the perception of color can change depending on, on people. We all might be seeing the same thing, but we, we can all look at the same wall, and it could look blue over there. But Somebody might actually think it's painted blue. It could be painted blue. Um, it's blue light, but who's to say? So um, my perception of, of when I was looking at this concept, I thought this was a more yellow gun. So that's I 
painted it that way. And then, um, of course, my, my art lead was like, no, I think that's a, a green gun, and it's just the lighting is, is different. And then, of course, you look in Just Cause 2 video, and it's like a dark blue. Maybe it's just cooler colors. So it was really trying to figure out exactly what the right color is. So um, to, to figure this out, we actually use Pantone colors, and uh, those are color codes that stand for a specific shade. Uh, they're the standard language of colors. So if you're trying to figure out the right colors for a game, look into Pantone, and this allows you to know exactly what shade you're looking at and get a unified like a cons uh, consensus uh, with your team on, on it, where's the right balance. So is it yellow, green, red? And just figure out the color correction. Uh, and through here, I'm using special maps to build up the, the detail, the texture. I utilize smart materials, alpha masks, and edgeware generators. That gets me pretty much half, half the way. Um, but the real, the real um, like cherry on top is when you start customizing and, and mixing more than one smart mask, start like hand painting certain things. Um, like uh, if you look in the front of the barrel, there's some, there's some like, uh, uh, like smudges and everything. Those are hand painted. Um, you really want to make sure you get that base level, and then you really push it with more personalized uh, textures. So texturing iteration. Um, you're communicating with the art director, weapon lead, the product owner. You provide screenshots of progress and send to said parties. And you fix and adjust based on that feedback. The process can take a while, depending on how many iterations, until there is a look that the art lead is satisfied with. And in here, this is, uh, this is within Substance Painter. And right here is pretty much the, the setup that I had. Originally, it's kind of setting, making it really simple for yourself, maybe uh, throwing on some steel and painted metal and rubber, and then isolating whole chunks of the of the mesh. But then eventually, your file structure can get really immense. And the main key thing here is to stay organized. So, like I've created different folders for different parts. So you have the stock, the barrel. Then I have an overall rust on there. And then the final touches. Uh, after getting all those ingredients there, uh, we needed to push it even further. This weapon was a weapon of the agency, so we used a logo uh, of the agency, and it has changed in Just Cause too. So we put in a new one and talked to the narrative designer who uh, I was like, what should we put on this weapon? And he came up with something and basically created a decal map for it and just stamped it right on, on the weapon. This, this decal map, it, it different workflows, but you can do it in Photoshop or Substance Painter. I figured there's different fonts I could work with and I could be a little bit more customized. In there, I've just, that's like my preference because I'm very used to working with Photoshop when it comes to decals. So I, I created that and then brought it into Substance. So yeah, I've worked with generators, edgeware generators, smart materials, layered dirt masks. This is just building up everything here. And then within this last part is the PBR, uh, PBR validation. Um, basically, the areas where they're green means that they're approved, they're within the range of PBR. So PBR is physically based rendering. It's a standardized workflow for texturing your assets and really to achieve realistic metal values that exist in the real world. And this just allows all the games now to really have a standard way of texturing. Before it was not standardized, and it was the art. It was sort of up to the artist's job to really look by eye, manually figure out how to make realistic metal. But now, since we have a standardized workflow, we have different values that we can just sort of put in, and then use our artistic eye to, if we need to break it, to make it look better for our game. Then that works. But to to set it to a standard 
we start with this, we have the, uh, the uh, PBR uh, validation. And then after that, we have final integration. Hopefully through this process, you continuously, if you have the time, just continuously export your textures and keep seeing the updated one in your engine because even though it, looked, it could look really nice in Substance Painter, it could look really nice in Marmoset, um, but at the end of the day, it's going to be viewed in the engine. So it's very crucial to do that all the time. I did that so many times, and I had a thousand other screenshots. But for this presentation, I just wanted to show like the core ones. And for this one, this is the final integration. And uh, it allows you to give you, get you a sense of, OK, is this the way that we want it to look like? And you know, it, it worked out. So yeah, this is, this is a shot of him uh, with the weapon. And uh, yeah, so that's, that's my presentation. Thank you, everyone. And uh, I want to point over here. I keep thinking it's in the back. But uh, really quick, these are little toy vehicles that uh, we also worked on. And uh, I figure that would be a good ending here. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. So uh, we're, I guess we're going to Q&A. Hi. Um, my name is uh, Joseph Whittington. Um, so my team and I, we're about to start Final Project next month, and we're actually doing a PBR workflow for Xbox. And one of the limitations that we ran into early on was um, the student SDK that they gave us really limits our memory space. So like, what are some things that we can do to kind of um, simplify our, our memory usage in our asset pipeline. Um, are you talking in terms of like the Substance Painter file or? Uh, yeah, just like, like um, for example, like uh, it was a great idea when you um, had the texture that had multiple maps in it. Mm -hmm. Like uh, we're going to be doing that. Is, oh, this, ma like map yeah. packing, like channel packing? Yeah, is there anything else like that that we can do to kind of simplify our memory footprint on the GPU? Right. Um, I think the, yeah, the map packing is a great idea and uh, another thing is to figure out how many materials your assets are using. Sometimes, uh, sometimes for certain reasons, you might be working on a weapon or a prop and you think like, okay, part of this is gonna be metal, part of it's gonna be wood. So let me separate the, uh, the, the model based on the materials. But no, like I think you should, if anything, most props, can be done with one one texture map and one material. If it's in environments, that's different. Vehicles can be different too. So um, I would say, look look through your inventory and see which assets have more than five materials assigned to it. If you have, a, let's say, a vehicle has five materials, each material has three maps. So right there, it's 15 textures, texture files. Let's say each one is a targa, and that's five megabytes. So five megabytes for 15 files just for one asset. And if that asset is being loaded into the game, let's say 15 times, or you have like, I don't know, five, like 20 cars on the road, it, it builds up. So keep an eye on the material count, because there's, those are all draw calls. And depending on the engine, too, they, there's different ways that the engine runs that, but look into the material. And, and don't over, you don't use a larger resolution than you need to. For example, don't do a 4K texture on a, a computer prop. Or maybe do a, this like water bottle could be like a 256 by 256, and it could even include the computer, if, or like, I don't know, like a computer mouse. So try to, try to look where you can optimize in your, in your texture files. Uh, I think that adds more than, let's say, poly count, but also keep an eye on the poly count as well. Of course. Hi, my name's Jenna. Um, I'm in game art, and I was actually going to ask you a little bit about um, as far as like the pipeline process goes, how long do you think from start to finish on average it takes for you to um, get feedback and like basically start out with the block out and then have that finalized textured piece that goes in game? So Is there like, like an average? Okay, so like the average like estimate of making an entire weapon. Like a hero prop. Right, um, so if it's a weapon, it, it, it could depend because 
it's sometimes hard to gauge because you might be working on multiple assets. Like even with this, I was working on multiple assets. Um, typically, though, like it could do from a week to three weeks, depending on the complexity, um, because you're also as mentioned, you're working with an animation team, working with the gameplay programmers. Sometimes they might not have the time to respond to you quickly, so you move on to some other asset until you get a response. So um, taking that into account, it can add up. If you're, work if you're doing, let's say you're doing all of those things, like you're working on a smaller a a game on your own, um, then you're the one that's answering all those things, so it might be shorter, but typically it's like, I would say like three weeks. Okay. Cool. Yep. Thanks. Okay. Um. All right. Um, how long do it take to, uh, you know, to finalize the just just cost for you? Yeah. How long is the production? Uh, like the the production in entirely. Um, right. It was. Uh, I believe it was about three to four years of development, and then uh, about a year for DLC. Hi, my name's Jordan. Um, I was just curious on what was the biggest mistake you made in a project, and then how did you bounce back from that? Oh, that's a good <laughs> one. Uh, biggest mistake on a project? Um, I don't make mistakes. <laughs> I'm kidding. I'm I'm kidding. That, I'm human, and that, that's the thing. Like, uh, it's so it's it's okay to make mistakes. You're gonna make mistakes. Um, you just if you have a good team, they'll help you bounce back. Um, there's been times where I think. Can I get a show of hands how many work in Autodesk Maya? Oh, nice. This is my crowd right here. So you all know. Um, yeah, like, um, it's, it's gotten better. They have, like, recovery f uh, functions, but it used to be, like, workarounds. Um, so I would be working in, like, uh, let's say, um, let's say I was working in a file, and I got in really good progress. I had a lot of feedback, and for some reason, this, this is what it hap this can happen, just like always back up your stuff. Always have backups of backups. I was working in, an, in a file for quite a few hours, and I kept saving and saving and saving. And I thought that was doing something. I also have incremental save on all the time. Turn on incremental save, that's a very valuable function. Um, and if, if you don't like that, like the files take up so much space because it saves 100 uh, files, keep it to 20, and it'll automatically delete them, the, the oldest ones. Um, but I had thought I had incremental save, forgetting that I had just got uh, received a new computer. I thought I had incremental save on. And I'm like saving, saving, saving. And I got like a bunch of feedback throughout the day, had a lot of notes. And then um, my Maya scene crashed. And then I tried to click on it, and it got, it was corrupted. And I, uh, I think what happened was um, it didn't get corrupted, but I clicked on it, and the way that I clicked on it, it said it cannot recognize the file, and nothing showed on the grid. So I was like, oh, that's okay. I got incremental save on. So I went to my incremental folder. There's no incremental folder because it was a new computer, and I just got it the day before. So um, make sure to fig figure that out and have to talk to your producer. Like They're like, in the beginning, I was like, oh, yeah, getting a lot of good feedback. I'm applying it in right now. And then they come back. They're like, so how's it going? I'm like, I don't have anything to work with now. So I have to start from square one. Luckily, um, but the value in that is when you're, on it, when you're honest with your team with things like that, um, you want to tell them as, as soon as you can or as soon as you know to how to formulate what happened. And they can help bounce you back. So for example, um, there was the second time around that I was working with it that all this feedback I had, I didn't have to go do what I was doing before. I could just iterate. I could start creating uh, the vehicle with all those feedback already that I had. So it, it could have taken me, let's say, eight hours. It actually took me four hours and, you know, like the, got me on my merry way. But Keep an eye on that. Make sure that incremental save is on. Make sure you have your backups. You never know what you never know what's going to happen. I mean, we work with technology, and it's great and everything, but like it is still technology, and it, it can sometimes malfunction. Thanks. 
Yeah, sorry, I forgot to introduce myself. I'm Ahmad from the Game Design Masters. Um, I'm just, uh, I'm just wondering about the animation. Do you use mo uh, motion capture or keyframes, or do you use both? Um, so motion capture has been very popular in video games now, um, similar to like how PBR is taking over the industry. Um, but it, it is still, both are valued and both of them are still being used. Yeah, so it's just a lot more motion capture now, but at the end of the day to really get those nuanced and the, the, real, the real like emotion, sometimes the, the motion capture gives you a standard and then the keyframe is just even pushing it. The, art, the artists do a great job on that, like the, the animators do that. Yeah, keyframes. So yeah, so like, let's say if you have a motion capture, uh, they have a pose where they're just like going around, um, and then have somebody like let's say gesture or something. Uh, I think it, it could be improving now, and I mean it's constantly improving. Uh, who knows? Like they might start putting it on the fingertips, but like sometimes we don't have that like the more fidelity. And when you have an animator come in, they might realize oh the thumb didn't bend a certain way, and just adding that more realness to it. Thanks. Hi, it's uh, me again. Um, so uh, quick question. How does uh, Avalanche handle uh, LOD chain generation for assets? Uh, so we work with Simplygon, Simplygon um, which generates the LODs. And other times, though, um, if we need to, depending on the asset, if there's like metallic values in it, uh, we would have to do it manually. So it's it's a mixture. Uh, I know uh, I know certain engines also do like LOD creation, but typically you get a pretty good you pr get a pretty good um, a really uh, pretty you get to a pretty good point with simply gone and ma manual work. You, you learn how to do s reduction quite f fast after doing it for a while. Okay, so follow-up question. Um, we're currently integrating the Simplygon SDK into our engine. Um, what, are there like any like serious issues that you guys ran into using Simplygon? Um, any serious issues? Um, no, I think it's a pretty good tool. You just have to make sure that you have like the, the settings the way you want. And like I said, um, there could be, it, it really depends on how the artist models and if like you're using like mirror UVs methods, and it might try to take out the center line, and if you take it, if it takes out the center line, your UVs just go all out of whack. That's not a simply gun issue. That's more on the the art to like set it up correctly. Um, but no, I think simply gun does a really great job at optimizing the meshes, and you could just get something in like within like 30 seconds to two minute two minutes if you have a really complex asset. Thanks. We have Nova joining us on YouTube who wants to know, does Avalanche use the combining of textures and RGB channels in every single asset, and does this present any issues in the pipeline? Combining of RGB. So we do use, uh, we do use uh, channel or map packing for every asset that we work with because, again, we don't want to have if we already have the normal map as one map, and then we have the base color, if we had metallic roughness and a wild card in all of them, that means we'd have five textures as opposed to three. So this just allows us to optimize um, all our, all basically the, the whole art content that's being brought into the engine. Awesome. Thanks. Thank you so much. Yeah, thank you everybody. Appreciate it. <laughs>